And this is what I fear the most of this particular moment. You know, the economy just experienced this extraordinary supply shock. It was beyond our control, this virus. We had to shut down all these sectors. And that created structural unemployment. And gee whiz, our natural rate of unemployment now is not 3%, it's 20%. And so there will be some, you know, smart person down the line who will be telling us we cannot really reduce unemployment below 10% because now that's the natural. And you might remember, you know, this is exactly the, what happened with the uh, European Commission when they were forecasting unemployment in Spain, right? 26% uh, Nairo. You know, what, what kind of a science do we have and discipline do we have where we not only think that's normal, but we actually design policies around it. Like, have you heard a politician that would say, you know what, the natural rate of homelessness is 5%, please just stick with that number. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard our guest this week, author and associate professor of economics at Bard College, Pavlina Cheneva. And we're going to be talking to Pavlina in a moment about the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic, but also we'll be looking ahead to the recovery effort and ask what a more rational and resilient economic system would look like. Of course, right now, the drive should be to get money into people's hands as fast as possible as unemployment skyrockets. But I think it's also going to be useful to have a vision of what we should be pushing for longer term. Pavlina is known for her extensive research and advocacy of the MMT job guarantee. And to borrow the title of Pavlina's forthcoming book, I'm going to briefly outline a case for the job guarantee as I see it. The MMT descriptive framework for understanding modern money is that each time the government spends a pound, dollar or yen, depending on where you live, it spends a new pound, dollar or yen into existence rather than taking money from somewhere else in order to spend it out again. The government is the monopoly issuer of its own currency and it spends and taxes by changing bank balances, which are just numbers on a spreadsheet, using computer keystrokes at its central bank. Because fiat currency, dollars, pounds, yen, has no intrinsic value, the government creates that value by demanding taxes be paid in pounds, dollars or yen, ensuring a permanent demand for its currency and allowing it to spend its otherwise worthless currency tokens into existence, again using keystrokes. And this allows it to pay for things it needs to provision itself, and this creates government sector jobs. The government most of the time spends more than it takes offers in tax and that money left over held by us in the private sector is what we use to transact with each other and create private sector jobs. And this brings us to the job guarantee. In a system set up like this, if there is residual unemployment after the government's done all of its spending and the private sector's done all of its spending, the unemployment that remains is there because there is not enough spending power in the economy to ensure everybody has a job. So the government has either spent too little into the economy or taxed too much out of it. And it's entirely the government's responsibility to change this. It's not the fault of private individuals for, say, not spending more in a recession or the fault of firms for laying off people because their incomes have gone down. Only the government can counter a trend of rising unemployment because it's the only actor in the economy that can spend more than it takes in permanently. It's the only actor in the economy that can act, as they say, counter cyclically. The MMT view is the way to fix this is to put more spending power into the economy. And that means increasing the deficit. And when you're the currency issuer, the government, there are two ways you can do that. You can either increase government spending or lower the tax on the whole economy, or both, depending on your politics. As economist L. Randall Ray says, MMT is consistent with a small government and it's consistent with a big government. 
But the problem is that it's impossible to target a precise deficit figure in money terms that will ensure full employment, but also avoid inflation, because that ideal number is a moving target. So governments have historically made the choice to avoid inflation by ensuring unemployment and using sanitized terms like the natural rate of unemployment to justify the hardship and social destruction caused by this choice. So what we have at the moment is a system of what's called macroeconomic automatic stabilizers. When unemployment goes up, more people go on unemployment benefits and money paid from the government to the economy goes up, which increases the deficit automatically. And also because the private sector is earning less as a whole, tax payments from the economy to the government go down also increasing the government deficit. So automatically, the deficit increases in a downturn and decreases in a recovery. And that's the way we manage inflation at the moment, with an expanding and contracting buffer stock of unemployed humans, people who would take a job if they could find one. And these people are paid just enough to hopefully not die. But unfortunately, in many cases, it's not enough. And we do all this in order to control inflation. The MMT proposal is to change this buffer stock from an unemployed one to an employed one by having the government guarantee an offer of a full-time job at a socially inclusive wage, not a subsistence wage, to anyone that wants one. It's not designed to replace any other type of benefit, especially disability benefits. It's voluntary. You can still choose unemployment benefits if you want. It's only designed to replace involuntary unemployment. It's locally administered but funded by central government, which to bring this full circle is the only actor in the economy that can never run out of money. If you want more detail on what this would look like on the ground, we'll be talking to Pavlina about it in a moment. But also you can listen to our episode four with Dr. Fidel Kaboob for an introduction. And you should definitely pre-order Pavlina's book, The Case for a Job Guarantee. I've linked to where you can do that in the show notes. There is also a link to Pavlina's fantastic Job Guarantee FAQ page, which until her book comes out is a great way to understand more about it. Thank you as ever for sticking with us and putting the time into understanding modern money. If you can support us financially, it really helps keep the show going. There's a link to our Patreon page in the show notes, but really we're just grateful for your time and attention and we hope you're staying safe and well. Let's dive in. Hi, welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Patricia Pino. Hi, Patricia. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm very excited, actually. I think you know why. We're very excited because our guest is so in demand that Patricia met her at the 2018 MMT conference in New York. We've been trying to arrange this interview ever since. So we're honored and delighted to talk to economist, author, job guarantee maestro, Welcome to the MMT podcast, <laughs> Pavlina Cheney. Thank you, guys. It's so generous. It's so good to be with you. It's long overdue. It only took two years. Oh, no. I can't do that. I, I consider myself lucky. <laughs> All right. I'm making amends. <laughs> so I'd like to start with the fact that uh, the US Congress just voted to spend $2.2 trillion to save the American economy. Now, for any first-time listeners, where did they get the money from, Pavli? Oh, gee, it looks like they somehow found it overnight. <laughs> I, I don't think they called any taxpayers, honestly. I don't think they rang up the phones and called foreign borrowers. You know, it's so unfortunate that, you know, we have to see a pandemic or a major crisis to see how government truly spends and how it has all of the funding capacities to fund policy priorities. And, you know, this is what we mean by monetary sovereignty. This is the case for the United States. This is the case for many countries around the world that have their own currency and they have their own institutions that ensure that all government payments are made, like ministries of finance and um, central banks that coordinate as needed to meet all payments, debts, and obligations. And, you know, very unfortunately, in Europe, that in the Eurozone in particular, you know, those institutions have been separated. And while here in the U.S., we can muster an enormous package literally overnight and appropriate that expenditure, Europe is still stuck in trying to figure out how to go about this because they don't have monetary sovereignty and the same kind of funding capacity. Just talk about that $2.2 trillion rescue package. Is it enough? And is that even the right question? Well, if I think you're absolutely right. The money is has always been a dishonest question. Where can you find the money? That has always been kind of a political gimmick 
it has been used to deny certain policies and certain policy priorities. So it's really not a matter of, can we find the money? Yes, we can. The question is, what do we spend it on? How shall we think about government policy, public policy? And that has been always the focus of MMT. I think in a way, this is the irony of our name. It's called modern monetary theory and everybody thinks it's about money, but we always try to say it's not about the money. The money is the easiest answer. It is about how we spend the money and what we do with it. And so when you look at what we did here in the United States, 2.2 trillion appropriated, which is about 10% of GDP, that's quite extraordinary to do that overnight. And, you know, the government already has another budget, which is about 20% of GDP. So we are putting the public sector front and center to respond to this crisis. And that's, that is the purpose of the public sector. Now, what is our current thinking? The current thinking is in the United States, unfortunately, there are different models around the world, but in the US is let's just provide some emergency assistance to the unemployed and it's one time short term. Let's provide lots of loans to small businesses and bailouts for big corporations as a sort of a lifeline. So what we're doing is we are reacting to an extraordinary crisis by providing a lifeline and on the assumption that this might be a temporary major shock to the system and the economy will bounce back up once we have managed the virus. I think all of these points are wrong. Like all of them are incorrect. All of these assumptions are incorrect. Number one, it's not going to be, you know, a quick recovery. Number two, whatever we are seeing today is just the tip of the iceberg. We saw some unemployment numbers come out today in the United States, truly extraordinary. I mean, absolute hemorrhage, it's an avalanche, it's a catastrophe in the labor market. And that is happening across the globe. You know, just like the unemployment, just like the virus ravages the world, so does the unemployment. And we uh, we need to start thinking uh, with new tools in a different way of how we're going to address this problem. To throw two trillion into the economy with the hope that loans and emergency cash assistance will stop the hemorrhage, I think it is incorrect. We will have to be throwing maybe 10 times as much to carry us through this crisis. So no, I, I would not have done it this way. I would have gone a different way in terms of stabilizing the economy. And one of those would be protecting payrolls. It is far easier to, to in a sense, to simply pay the wage bill than to have to deal with an enormous unemployment problem once it has developed. And if you just crunch in the numbers, the package that we just passed would have been enough to cover every single wage in the economy and pay the unemployed. In, in fact, that's in your article, which we'll link to. Your article's called What If We Nationalize Payroll? You write, it's easier to keep people in their jobs than to create jobs once the layoffs have occurred. Can you say why that is? Well, I mean, the title was provocative and it was meant to highlight the fact that we passed a budget that would have been enough to keep people in their jobs for the following three months. And if you pay them 100%, if you pay less than 100%, 75% of what Denmark is doing, then you would keep people in their jobs for longer. So it was just to you know shock the senses to say look why are we dealing with with a with a hemorrhage as opposed to preventing it from from happening now i mean our economy in the united states our labor market is very unequal very precarious a very I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to underwrite some of the inequities that we see in the labor market. There are lots of people that are um, overpaid, lots of people who are underpaid. We have a big proportion in our economy that work in gig jobs and people are self-employed. And so we have we don't have some of the stable contracts and benefits that some European nations have. And so in a way, if the government were to pay everybody's wage, it will be validating and underwriting some of these processes. So my argument argument there was that we will be dealing with a major, major impact on the labor market and the government will have to respond. And it is already responding. And as a consequence, it bears the responsibility for putting strings attached to some of these bailouts, whatever shape and form they may take, for reforming the labor market so it is not as precarious as and, and unsecure, for addressing the kinds of economic insecurities that people experience on an ongoing basis. You know, we don't provide sick leave in the United States. We don't have universal health care coverage. Uh, once you lose your job, you may lose, if you're lucky to have health insurance, you may lose it from unemployment. And so it was a call to rethinking what we want the government to do. 
how to do it and how do we want to emerge out of this moment of crisis to provide better employment, better uh, conditions and um, a more resilient economy. Yeah. And as you know, in the, in the UK, our government has effectively underwritten 80% of the wages of most employees. Uh, for people who are above the minimum wage, that might be all right. For people who are already at very low wages, that might be the thing that tips them over the edge and they, you know, you start seeing mass defaults anyway. But my question was about what would you have the government request in exchange for this? Would you, for example, have the government request certain projects to be done from these companies or to use their resources in a way in exchange for the government guaranteeing the wages of all their employees? Or would you make it in- unconditional? No, I will extract Uh, some big guarantees from the private firms if they are getting the lifeline. Without the government sector, they are not viable. These are catastrophic and uninsurable events. Firms cannot prepare for them and we clearly workers cannot prepare for them. So the government needs to step in periodically every 10 years to rescue an economy from its, from its various collapses and fragilities. So here's how I think about this problem today. We have very immediate concerns and they deal with the wholesale decimation of jobs as a consequence of the required social distancing. So we need to do something about that. And what I would do is protect those jobs And by doing so, requiring firms to do certain basic things like pay living wages or increase the minimum wage, pay guaranteed benefits. They come with strings attached. Sick leave has to be part of the package. Healthcare, short of nationalizing healthcare, which is really a good policy, uh, firms have to provide it. That would be another uh, condition. Uh, right to bargain, negotiate. A, a series of protections for workers that come with this lifeline to firms. At the same time, we already have seen many millions of people lose their jobs in a blink of an eye, and we need to do something for them. Now, this business of providing even if generous unemployment insurance and one-time or two-time or five-time cash assistance is all well and good, but it doesn't solve the unemployment problem. This is not a job creation program. You know, this is a program to hopefully keep people afloat, but we know the devastation that unemployment causes the entire economy and how it perpetuates and the social cost that it brings and how it never solves itself on its own. And so, you know, I would have to, I would think about responding to the jobs problem today and tomorrow, again, in, in these two ways. What do we need to do today? What do we need to do tomorrow? If there are many unemployed people today, I will provide income support, but I would even open up a jobs guarantee program and I will enroll people. I'll put them on the payroll. I will even use this program right now to train and place folks in critical sectors that are seeing shortages. I mean, we should not fool ourselves. We actually have acute shortages in some sectors, like the healthcare sector, you know, building hospitals, you know, all of these drive-through field clinics, whether it is sanitation workers, whether it is staffing and training nurses, whether it is manning the phone lines, you know picking up the phone and addressing the 911 or emergency calls that we have in the United States. There's just so much that can be done. You know, my kids' teachers are scrambling, educating their own kids and running their own online classes. We can certainly do a lot more teacher assistance to run online classes. There is stuff to be done. We just don't think about this. And it's so much harder to do it in the midst of a crisis than if we had been prepared. But You know, clearly you can't put everybody at risk. You know, you need to do this with the clear safety provisions and requirements, but we realize that we need to do the work and there are people who can do it. And so we just have to find mobilization, wartime kind of effort to put those resources to work. A lot of other people will not uh, will not be able to work. And, um, you know, there are still, you know, maybe 10, 15 million people unemployed. We can employ them very quickly into this standby policy that guarantees them a job when the time comes. And when we are ready to resume, if at all we can resume normal economic activity. And when that time comes, we will, be, we will have inherited a very different economy. 
some sectors probably would have been decimated. You know, think of uh, concert halls, theaters, right? Think of uh, sports games. I mean, will we be having these mass congregations uh, over the next year if we're still attempting to deal with the virus? I think that it's very reasonable to expect that many sectors will be operating at a lower capacity precisely because we've got to maintain some sort of social distancing measures even past the most acute period of the pandemic. And if that is happening, what that means is that certain sectors are releasing resources. They are releasing equipment, workers, they will be excess capacity and it will be again incumbent upon the public sector to rethink that process of restructuring. You know, how do we transfer these labor resources from one place to another? And it's not like there's a shortage of things to do. You know, as we often say, you know, in the MMT community, you know, we've got big problems we have not attended to for a very long time, from infrastructure to transitioning to a green economy to on and on now the health healthcare sector, where finding out how sorely under provision it is. So we've got things to do, but we have to start planning. So how do you lay out the case for a job guarantee? Oh, I think it's a good place to start, you know, with this notion that we have become so accustomed with the idea to the idea that unemployment is unavoidable. It's unfortunate, it's too bad, but there's nothing we can do about it. And most people don't realize that the unemployed is still the charge of the public sector. You know, there's still, you know, part of the responsibility for the unemployed is the public sector, not only because our monetary system itself creates unemployment in the way you described. It's a monetary production economy. You have to pay fees. Everything is that, that you know, we need to access for our well-being is through the monetary system. And that monetary system is underwritten by the public sector and its currency and by a banking system that is uh, managing this currency, if you will. It, ultimately, the buck stops with the government and the sovereign currency issuer and providing it in a way that everyone can access it so that they can provide for their basic necessities. So it's not just the provision of the income alone, but also uh, the manner in which we can access the real resources that will provide for our well-being. So we're, we're failing on both counts. You know, we're not providing the income, and we're certainly, even when we throw little pittance of unemployment insurance on, on the unemployed, uh, we are still not thinking about, hang on a second, have we really restructured the economy to, to provision well for everyone? So number one, the problem of unemployment is unavoidable is this very medieval notion to me. You know, I'm thinking that, you know, there will be a time, I hope that it comes <laughs> sooner than later, where we will look at this paradigm with such, like, you know, shock. Just like 100 years ago, you know, women didn't have the right to vote. And for us now, that is totally unacceptable. But if you read all the all of the commercials at the time, oh, gee, we can't give women the right to vote. Imagine, but you know, did. the world will fall apart if that happens. I, I am not wearing trousers. <laughs> is that, that? You know, all these decisions. I, I, I'm keeping quiet as the uh, <laughs> as the token man in the episode. But but you're right. I mean, like those were they were convention. There was a conventional wisdom at that time that found it preposterous to give women the right to vote, and. It was similar for, for child labor. And then we have developed and they have, we have become accustomed to certain rights. And, you know, one of them, you can think the right to education. You know, we no longer provide it through parochial schools or through charity, etc. cetera. We, we decided that the public sector has this responsibility to guarantee access to education. And in the U.S., we do it very poorly. But what I'm hoping that we will arrive to this understanding is that there is nothing natural about unemployment and nothing unavoidable about it. And in this particular monetary system, it is incumbent on us and it's the responsibility of the public sector to address it. The second point that I will say is that the public sector is already paying for unemployment. And unemployment, if economists were to do their due diligence and if they were to account for all of the social costs of unemployment and look to our colleagues from the cognitive sciences and look at their research, then you know we will actually, even if you do your traditional cost-benefit analysis, you would see that it's far more beneficial to pay for decent family-sustaining jobs with family-sustaining wages to create something good than to pay for the neglect 
and the devastation that unemployment causes, not just on the unemployed, but on their families, on their children, on the communities. There are these negative social multipliers, which we already pay for. So any way you cut it, it is far better bang for the buck. Let's put it this way. And the third problem that you mentioned was this notion of the natural rate that is used as a policy tool. And that to me is one of the most egregious parts of our modern economy, that we've got central bankers around the world that have this concept of what is the appropriate, the correct number of people without jobs and livelihoods. And then what happens then is if we think that that number is too great, the Federal Reserve and the central banks attempt to stimulate economic growth, and whether they actually been able to do this is a whole other story, but they, they try to relax, you know, to stimulate the economy. And once they hit that magical number, they step on the brakes. And then you start getting economists who would say, well, hang on a second, and this is what I fear the most of this particular moment. You know, the economy just experienced this extraordinary supply shock. It was beyond our control, this virus. We have to shut down all these sectors. And that created structural unemployment. And gee whiz, our natural rate of unemployment now is not 3%, it's 20%. And so there will be some you know, smart person down the line who will be telling us we cannot really reduce unemployment below 10% because now that's the natural. And you might remember, you know, this is exactly the, what happened with the uh, European Commission when they were forecasting unemployment in Spain. Right, 26 percent Nairo. You know what? What kind of a science do we have, and discipline do we have, where we not only think that's normal, but we actually design policies around it? Like, have you heard a politician that would say, "You know what? The natural rate of homelessness is five percent. Please just stick with that number." <laughs> it's like it's the invisible hand, though, isn't it? You're not supposed to mess with it. That's right. It's the invisible. It's the invisible hand, and clearly the invisible hand can't do uh, everything we want it to do. We know this, but we also have a visible hand too. Let's use both hands. <laughs> Wash them first, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Wash them first. Yeah. Um, can, 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 I, can I ask a slightly unrelated question? Well, it's not. It's related. But um, I know we've been like focusing on the job guarantee because you've done so much great work on that. But one of the aspects of the of the bailout packages that both the UK and the US have had is that at least half of it, I think, focuses on loans as opposed to grants, as opposed to um, wage subsidies, etc. If we're seeing the unemployment rate shoot up, even in the face of these kind of facilitating loans for businesses... Is that as you know proof that these loans are pretty much doing nothing, or, or um, and why why is that? That's right. The the focus on loans is misguided. What we need is to increase income in the economy, and when when we see in the Fed is forecasting thirty two percent unemployment rate, that means that. You know, a whole lot of people don't have income. It doesn't matter how many loans and how many, you know, zero cost loans you provide to a firm. They won't uh, be so enthusiastic to keep or protect payrolls or to invest if uh, there is not enough spending. So this is really a major misunderstanding of what uh, government should do. The government should not be just a lender. It has to be a spender. And this ties into MMT, who has the capacity to spend unlike any other uh, sector. That is the public sector. The currency issuer has that ultimate capacity to provide income and spend it into existence. So but loans have to be repaid. And loans can be forgiven if firms retain some of, some of the payrolls. But we are already faced with extraordinary unemployment rates. So, in fact, you might even see this kind of calculus on behalf of corporations where they would say, you know, I'm not even so willing to take that loan because I am already forecasting 30% decline in my capacity and, and my industry. So I won't even take the loan because I cannot promise that I can hold on to my uh, payroll and to my workers. And then I'll be stuck with a loan that is not forgivable. So it is such a convoluted way of thinking about these processes. And then you look at the Fed, you know, the Fed cannot spend money into existence. You know, that's not their authority and their legal power. They need to get permission from Congress. Well, but the Fed can provide loans and it's 
seems it is refinancing the corporate, bloated, over-leveraged corporate sector endlessly now, just like it did once for the financial sector. And that still is not going to do the trick. We need to have total income, total spending, total employment grow in the economy. If you have a job, you can pay your mortgage. If you have a job, you can buy a plane ticket. And and, and that, is the, that is the idea. So loans, again, are a short-term lifeline, but they don't deal with the solvency problem that these companies are facing. They will be defaulting. They will be going under because we don't have the aggregate demand and, and expenditure. So we are going about this in such a complicated way when there are really direct, shortcuts to dealing with um, with this crisis and the dominoes are falling so it's not just corporations now states in the united states states are experiencing acute shortages and they are largely responsible for the for the um, mobilization effort because the federal government is dilly-dallying and it's not doing the kind of investment that they are financially capable of undertaking. So states, which are not monetarily sovereign, have to respond. The tax revenue is collapsing and states, unlike the federal government, are dependent on tax revenue. Tax uh, revenues are collapsing, so they're going broke. So not only that they cannot respond to the coronavirus uh, pandemic, they cannot fill their pension funds. They are freezing hiring. They will lay off workers very soon. They won't be able to support their public universities. They will probably default next. And the dominoes will keep falling. Why not pay the bills for the states? The government could pay them Pay the bills. Don't provide them a loan or some sort of temporary assistance. The states have to act pro-cyclically, right? Only the federal government can act counter-cyclically. Well, you know, in the U.S., it's, it's we have added insult to injury. So states... Oh, you've got these balanced budget laws as well, yeah? That's right. And that has forced them to act pro-cyclically. I mean, even states will act in a counter-cyclical way, typically, because they are more responsible for social programs. And that will increase the deficit in, a, in your garden variety recession. And tax revenues are going to shrink. And you're going to run deficit, but, but states have to finance themselves through borrowing, not like the federal government. Still, that will be some sort of counter-cyclical support. And then the federal government often provide some grants in aid to to help this counter-cyclical response. But since we passed the balanced budget amendments, we have then forced them to cut in the middle of a recession. So exactly at the time when they need to provide a lot more support to the economy, they need to slash programs. And by the way, we are seeing this even right now. You know, like the New York State is proposed, you know, they have to uh, put together their budget. And we are already seeing, you know, proposed major cuts. So it's a completely uh, schizophrenic uh, approach that uh, doesn't doesn't really, you know, it prolongs the pain. So let's just underline that for our uh, friends in the Eurozone as well, uh, that, the, you know, the US states are in the position of the Eurozone states in that uh, they don't issue the currency in the United States of America, the federal government issues the currency and the, the states are currency users. And in the Eurozone, the uh, ECB is the currency issuer, I guess, and the states themselves, even though they are countries with some degree of sovereignty, their options are limited because of the Maastricht limit. What is it, 3%, Patricia? Well, yeah, it is 3%, but I was going to say yeah. that the Eurozone countries are in an even worse position than than the oh, states. Yeah, yeah. Um, they don't yeah. seem to agree how they're going to share the debt burden. But also, I saw a proposal today from the European Commission saying that member states could now get loans from the government, from, from the EU budget, basically, the EU budget, which has already been allocated. So there isn't much room to lend, but it seemed like a, a way of basically just going around the fact that the ECB should just fund these bonds. Did you hear about this? I mean, the euro, the, the eurozone has been fragile from day one by virtue of its design. I am uh, truly just horrified to see what will come out of this. We were not able to do well with one crisis, um, that the great financial crisis in Europe. And there's this added problem that the Eurozone is experiencing. All governments around the world have been under this austerity assault, under the false premise that we can't pay. Okay, And so we are all unprepared to address this crisis or whatever next one that comes. But then we have the Eurozone that has been designed. The architecture is on this austerity on steroids. And so we have put 
the member nations in the position of maybe U.S. states, but they don't have a federal government to provide the grants in aid and the kind of assistance that then we can. Yes, they are not currency issuers anymore, but they also are not tethered or attached to some sort of central spending authority for the eurozone as a whole. Now, the only currency issuer in this instance is the European Central Bank. But they are not, you know, the, the body that will design the policies that will be necessary to pull us out of the recovery and, they, you know, to spend, they can finance these proposals for euro bonds, for green bonds, if you recall, before the pandemic and all that. They can certainly provide financing. But we, we also need a body that does the mobilization effort, the, does the employment, the safety net for the Eurozone as a whole. And so, you know, what I see what is happening to the periphery countries right now, it is so extraordinary because the pain is amplified by this very deliberate unwillingness to support the public purpose. And and that's a travesty. So I think I heard a, a talk by you at the 2010 Fiscal Sustainability Conference, and you were talking about, up until now, economists have been talking about targeting a demand gap which is a really blunt measure, and, and that's why it always fails. And and you said the better way to go about this is targeting what you called a demand labor gap. But am I right? Could you talk about that? Th- that is that is right. Yeah, thank you for bringing up that point because that I feel is lost even on some of our progressive economists. Right. You know because there is this notion of progressive policy that is rooted in Keynesian tradition, but not a true representation of Keynes's policy. And we have this idea that as long as we just pour enough stimulus into the economy, you know, that money is going to find its way in the right places, in the right sectors, and they will boost investment. And that investment will boost employment. And so the focus is always on closing what is considered to be some hypothetical output gap, whatever the productive capacity on the economy is. And that changes, you know, with technological advancement, with changes in the labor force. I mean, that that's a moving target. But we're constantly trying to close that output gap between whatever that potential is and whatever the actual is. And there are different ways of doing this. You know, more Keynesian policies would be, you know, deficit spend and you know, pump a lot of uh, a lot of spending into the economy. Others, how did we do it in the great financial crisis? Uh, stabilize the banking sector, provide enough liquidity and purchase enough of those toxic financial assets. So if you stabilize the credit system, that will stabilize financing for investment. That will stabilize investment and investment will stabilize employment. And so employment is always, always at the end of our focus and of our analysis. We're trying to close some sort of output gap through either stabilizing finance or some generalized deficit spending. Now, we have to start thinking concretely. How about if we stabilized employment, the labor gap? And the problem ultimately is that we have mass unemployment that develops and it takes forever for that to shrink. What if we were to just employ the unemployed? And then we don't have to endure these jobless recoveries. We don't have to endure these protracted recessions. As I said, people who have income can pay their bills. That's your bubble up stabilization of the of finance, right? Mortgages don't have to default, if you will. And it seems to be a much more direct way. And even on the face of it, it's kind of the shortest distance between the objective and the tool. You have primary direct employment effects. They ripple through the community. Other folks start employing restaurants, shops, movie theaters, you name it. And you have a bubble up employment growth, employment led growth. I think that was the true Keynesian message anyway. Keynes wanted to create employment on the spot where the jobless were. And I don't know about you, Christian, but don't you feel like this notion that the government can and should create jobs is taboo. Yeah, yeah. It's like you do you try everything <laughs> yeah. except that. Yeah. And I don't know why. It's such a simple solution. Can you tell us like they have an allergy to this? If it, I'm sorry if it's been said before, but somebody did this tweet about trickle down economics is like trying to fill your own bathtub by going to the apartment above, filling their bathtub letting it overflow and hope that that water comes into your bath. That's brilliant. Uh, yes, I like it. Look, yeah. oh, I, I came across this great quote um, 
I was reading the uh, biography of uh, Francis Perkins, who was this truly you know, very important figure during the New Deal in the United States. She worked with Eleanor Roosevelt, and those two women were so responsible for just delivering to us the modern welfare state from minimum wages to 40-hour working week to Social Security, you name it. When she was appointed Secretary of Labor, I guess they either forgot about her or she was the last one to go through the ceremony, and she said... You know, labor always comes last. And and that stayed with me because, you know, that's what she faced in, in a time of most acute crisis when precisely at the time when labor was actually for the first time coming first. And even then, it took us a while to arrive at some of these fundamental reforms that we had to put in place to protect working families. And then, of course, we've gone over in the post-war era through this phase of, of forgetting those responsibilities of the government sector, this you know, uh, half a century assault on governments through austerity, uh, the Reagan, of course, and Thatcher revolution. And I think the question is unavoidable, that we, we have unfortunately come to this moment, and again, once again, as a consequence of great crisis, where these patchwork of policies we're trying to pass will not work, and at some point we will have to arrive again at that solution that the government has to do the investment and the employment. And then the question is whether that's going to be done in this sort of more democratic way um, or in a more reactionary way, you know, run by authoritarian governments that are exploiting this moment. So let's just take some time to address some of the common pushback that we've all heard. And, you know, we're late to the party, Pavlina. You've been going through this for like 25 years, I imagine. <laughs> some of the common pushback to the job guarantee. And obviously the landscape's changed as well. We've had the rise of Andrew Yang and all of that stuff. So, you know, these days you can't mention the job guarantee on Twitter without somebody shooting back something about UBI. And the most succinct way I've heard this talking point raised is this. Why do UBI with a labour request? requirement. Why not just UBI? So this person's identifying the job guarantee as well. It's like, you know, you're, you're giving me UBI, but you're making me work for it. So um, how do you address that one, Pavlina? Uh, the first one is that we nobody's making anyone do anything they don't want to, okay? We are yeah. uh, not requiring people to work in exchange for any benefits that they are receiving. Okay, this is a, a, a program that says, would you like to work? And if you do, we will provide that opportunity. And so this debate, I've been engaged in this academic debate for, for 20 plus years, and it's really, we're talking past each other. You know, people have different goals and different objectives, even though they are identifying a, a crucial point, the precariousness of the labor market and its inability to, to provision for people. But uh, we seem to have some different, you know, visions of, of what needs to happen going forward. What the job guarantee does is say the following. We have a lot of people who want to work. We have a lot of work to be done. Our society is engaged in provisioning for itself always. And it's a matter of organizing that provisioning. And so work, you know, I, I am less sympathetic to these post-work society visions of the future. You know, we can transform work. And I'm very interested in how we use these institutions to transform work. But I don't see a post-work society. We will all, always have to take care of each other. We will have to take care of our communities, take care of our children, our environment. And that requires work. How do we organize it? Now, UBI is very easy solution, right? I mean, or at least presumably easy solution, because the idea there is you provide the income and people happily go shop around and the market sorts it out. No, it doesn't happen. It doesn't sort it out without UBI. It's not going to sort it out with UBI. People will still need to figure out how to provision for themselves. Now, I think the, the job guarantee is completely consistent with a reduction in the working uh, week or in the working day. Do we want to be overworked and overstressed? No. So the UBI has a certain simplicity to it, which I think attracts a lot of people. And MMT has always said, you can pay for programs, and it doesn't mean you have solved the problem. 
and we need to find structural changes to our, our problem. So the job guarantee is perfectly consistent with reducing the working week and the working day. We don't want to have a society of overworked busy bees. We want good quality of life. We want we don't want to commute hours and hours every day to get to our jobs. We want local community jobs. We see our communities need those jobs. And so it's rethinking what we could do on a local level, uh, could do for our environment, and how we can create a working experience that's more dignified for everyone and is guaranteed. And so the, so the job guarantee is, is a different work experience, but it also deals with a different need, social needs that we want to address. Do we want everyone to work? Absolutely not. You know, I mean, no job guarantee advocate in their right mind will be advocating 100% employment. We know that there is care work that has to be done. We know that there are folks that need to be provided for. They cannot uh, work, should not work. And we do not want to have this society of overworked and stressed out people. So basic income has always been part of the package. So I think that this has been a very unproductive discussion overall. Uh, and I have many other criticisms of the UBI proposal on its own. I'm sure you've covered on this program in terms of just, you know, how, how um, what are the macroeconomic effects of, of providing a large scale UBI. You know, the job guarantee has these various ways in which it stabilizes an economy in which UBI does not. And so we are talking past each other. And uh, the bottom line is there's the work to be done. And we just need to find a way to do it. So other criticisms of the job guarantee focus a lot on on skills specifically. And I often find two sides. So one side that says, you know, you can't just put a person in a job. They need training and that takes ages. And, you, you know, they can't just start straight away. It cannot be as flexible as you want it to be. And other people say, you know, how can a, a job guarantee worker develop new skills and become upwardly mobile if he or she is stuck in a job guarantee work, you know, which it's, you know, presumed to be menial and, and, and low skill in inverted commas. What would you say to those people? Well, the first thing is that this pandemic is, is showing us that this menial work is one of the most essential work we, we need. You know, all those folks that, you know, we pejoratively say are unskilled workers, you know, the truck drivers that are delivering our food and our packages and that are working the, the lines at the grocery stores. I mean, I, we got to put that to rest once and for all. People don't have to be a computer scientist or, you know, coders for us to value their work and to give them dignified work. And you see these anecdotal reports where people say, I've never felt so valued and that as I do now, I understand how critical essential my work is. We don't pay them well. We underpay them. So that is, I, you know, I hope um, the crisis reveals how, how wrongheaded that criticism is. The second thing is that we seem to be always putting the emphasis on the project and on the job, quote unquote, rather than the person. Like when you start thinking about the person and not this hypothetical job, then your thinking changes in terms of what is required. It is a bit of a false dichotomy because often you will hear this argument, well, if the work needs to be done, then uh, not everyone can do it. But if you want to do jobs, create jobs for everybody, then you have to do unnecessary work and or just make work. I think that's a false dichotomy. That is definitely a, a wrong analytical angle. Uh, we have lots of things that we can do that, once again, we're not traditionally called to be high skilled, that uh, folks can do. You know, I come across a lot of people who um, uh, have disabilities and they tell me how difficult it is to find jobs in the private sector. And they say, if only there was like a job guarantee where like, you know, people can can understand that I cannot be standing up on my feet for eight hours a day. I can sit down. I have computer skills. I have something to offer then I would love, you know, that kind of program. So that's why I say it's important, and that's what the job guarantee does. It creates jobs with, with the mind, with the person in mind, rather than some hypothetical job that, uh, that has to be staffed. And we, uh, we can match the two. Here's another one. I hear this from people who aren't averse to a job guarantee. When the economy picks up again, the private sector starts hiring people out of the pool of job guarantee workers, which is a more liquid buffer stock than unemployed, a pool of unemployed workers. Surely some of the job guarantee jobs are going to end up having to get terminated. And at that point, it'll be the case that either the jobs weren't quote unquote necessary and the community does fine without them being done, or it turns out they were jobs that the community benefited from having done. And now there's nobody 
to do them. So as a job guarantee advocate, how could we address that concern? Yeah, the first thing to say is that every sector in the economy deals with labor flows. People come and go from every sector. This is not just a job guarantee problem. The second thing to say is that if we find, I mean, if we find that some of these newly created jobs are um, so well valued and they need to be a permanent part of the public sector, then we change the rules of the game. We staff it permanently. We entice and encourage people to stay there. But I mean, my ideal world, the job guarantee would be rather small. In my ideal world, I will staff every public sector um, area and uh, agency and service with the adequate staff to do their job on ongoing basis. So the job guarantee will be a guarantee for folks who have lost their jobs. And there are lots of jobs that can be expanded quickly and postponed. They can be postponed uh, if for some reason there's labor shortage. Lots of green work kind of invisible green work that needs to be done, environmental work, uh, can be delayed. It just takes a little bit of, of planning. But once again, what we are saying is compare that to the alternative, which is people coming in and out of mass unemployment, prolonged, possibly long-term unemployment, then coming and going from a job guaranteed job. That is um, the basis of comparison. So what I hear you saying is basically that the job guaranteed jobs are basically just a second tier of priority in, the, in in terms of the jobs that we need doing as a society. But that doesn't mean that that job that is a second priority, as it's in the job guarantee, could become a first priority job and therefore become, you know, a, a permanent, fully waged, potentially higher waged position in the public sector. Well, I, I would say, I mean, I wouldn't say like first or second, I would say it's an additional structure that we're putting in place. So there are always people in unemployment. There are millions of people on an ongoing basis that are in unemployment. So I imagine a structure and a system and an infrastructure that will always employ people. But they will be a component of those folks who will come and go out of the job guarantee program, just as they do with unemployment and just as they do with other sectors, right? The private sector constantly has to find itself shrinking or later expanding. So, you know, we can do the same with the public sector. Now, the second thing is that once you put a, a job guarantee in place, actually it stabilizes the overall economy. So those fluctuations should not be expected to be so large because we don't use unemployment as a stabilizer. If a person has a stable job, it's a whole different pattern of spending and consumption than if they don't know when they can find one. Then that structure will provide community public service work. Again, the focus is on the person and on the need to have family sustaining income. But what I'm trying to say is that there are some jobs like food and drug administrators and inspectors and engineers and even the universal child care that comes with the job guarantee. For me, that will be a permanent infrastructure. It will be there, rain or shine, because whether you work in the job guarantee or you have found a job outside, you still need child care. As so for me, that will be pro professionalized. It will be provisioned. It will be ongoing. Uh, but the other projects where you might find suddenly the private sector, the economy humming along and really demanding a lot more workers and starting to uh, look for well-trained folks, they can find them now from the job guarantee rather than the pool of unemployed, which they ignore anyway. You know, firms don't like to hire people who are unemployed. And so nothing changes in fundamental ways except that we have now put a structure that can provide some meaningful community work and uh, as opposed to no work at all with meaningful income for those who need it. Okay, great. So in your article, you write, the article is called What If We Nationalise Payroll? In that article, you write, only big government, big public investments, big public employment programs will ensure a quick bounce back rather than another protracted jobless recovery. Now, there will always be people who hear words like that and they get worried about inflation. Well, I mean, we can draw some parameters here in terms of the inflation analysis. You know, MMT says that inflation usually is a function of prices paid by government. Okay, so if you're a currency issuer and you provide various contracts to firms, you can set the terms of exchange. You, you can set, in a sense, the price, your price setter, and you can decide, are you going to provide contracts that are no-bid contracts? And, you know, are you not going to cap profits and let private sector determine what they charge you? I mean, yeah, you can go about it that way, or you can actually um, cap some of these. 
And we certainly have done this in times of war, and we have uh, used this prerogative of the currency issuer to set uh, certain prices. Now, in normal times, what the MMT says is that you really need to set one price in the economy. That's probably going to be uh, quite enough for price stability. And that will be the price of labor because it's the input of production for everything else in the economy. And without the job guarantee, the price of labor is zero. So we kind of have this constant quasi-deflationary environment without giving a solid price support for for workers and a, a, a universal minimum wage in a sense. So the counter-cyclical feature of the job guarantee ensures this sort of price stability or enhances, let me put it this way, enhances price stability as a consequence of normal business cycle fluctuations. It's just counter-cyclical. However, we have, um, and, and of course, if the government decides to double the wage of the of the job guarantee, that will ripple through the economy. There will be like a one-time price jump, and it might be significant, but again, it's prices paid by government that will influence the price level in the private sector. Now, we have other price setters in the economy. Uh, you know, we also have big monopoly power. We have industries that enjoy endless subsidies by the government, you know, and their their activities are underwritten. And in the United States, those are the healthcare industry. And, you know, some of the, the cost increases that people are experiencing have to do far more with monopoly power. It is the majority, again, of the state to regulate these industries. You know, we have we have history and tradition of dealing with monopsony and monopoly that are not public monopsonies, you know, monopolies. What could we expect today? We are not going to see the say the the kind of demand pull inflation or we're you know if you have thirty percent unemployment you're going to be faced probably with with deflation. Now there may be shortages in key sectors. We don't know, um, and you know if that happens in the food sector, then again, is the majority of the government to do some sort of rationing and to increase production as necessary. We are already seeing price gouging. We are already seeing competition for scarce medical resources. The public sector has another responsibility to deal with the real resource constraint. And that is the focus of MMT. Not only how prices are set, but also how productive capacity is used and enhanced to alleviate various various pressure. I just wanted to say something about job guarantee again. You had an idea, Pavlina, about who sets the jobs and who creates the jobs and who says what jobs are created. And the MMT concept of a job guarantee has always been about increased local democracy and increased, you know, allowing communities basically to run their own economies at local level. And what I really liked was your proposal for citizens themselves who find themselves in a position where they want to do a job guarantee, want to be part of the program to make their own proposals or identify local needs and say, look, I can do something about that if you'll give me a wage. I thought that was just lovely and kind of helped a lot in reassuring people that this wasn't really about, you know, central government completely disconnected from their needs, mandating what they should be doing. You know, this was about actually giving them more choice about what they should be doing. Isn't that how the Jefe's program in Argentina was conducted in part, that people were allowed to decide what the job was, what the business was that they were going to start? Yeah, yes, that's right. It was a, a bottom-up uh, design and proposal where local community groups uh, petitioned the municipalities and proposed projects and then listed how many people they, people they will need to staff those projects. Um, that would be a very suitable mo uh, model, uh, I think, you know, for the United States and other, other countries. But in the United States, the nonprofit sector provides a lot of social services. Okay, In some sense, because of the abdication of the responsibility of the federal government and states having these austerity policies imposed on them. And so the nonprofit sector has, has, has attempted to fill the void. There are many local groups that are already doing very good work. There is a big volunteer sector in the United States, but... So much of that really should be a service that is provided on an ongoing and stable basis. You know, there are, there are institutions that, that depend on the charity of volunteers, but then they cannot provide uh, the stable programs on an ongoing basis. So if we were to use that already existing infrastructure here, if we were to put out a call for proposals precisely this way through the local unemployment offices and say, please submit lists of projects that you are either doing, you would like to do, to do what will they look like and how many people can they employ? And one of the public purpose of, of this program will be to ensure that they are uh, tapping in the unemployment pool. 
But ultimately, the buck has to stop with the federal government. If there are not enough proposals to provide jobs for all, it does have to be a responsibility of the Department of Labor and perhaps the state offices of Department of Labor to ensure that there are enough projects. But as you said, the federal government doesn't really know very well the needs of this, the communities. So doing it from the bottom up, using these various models around the world of participatory budgeting and organization and using cooperative arrangements, there are many ways we can go about this. But I guess the bottom line is we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of work on the ground. We just need to empower them and just scale it up. Great. So just to close things out then, trying to learn lessons from the past as well. In the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis, we had the Occupy movement, an anti-austerity movement. The response we heard from a lot of politicians and pundits to those movements in the US and the UK was, look, it's unfortunate. We can't do anything now. We've run out of money. We spent it all on these bonuses. Could you give us the ammunition we need to fight the inevitable battle? we're about to have with deficit hawks because it's inevitable isn't it when it starts getting back up on its feet and be like well look at the government debt you know hopefully this will be the last time we'll have to fight this battle because we've reached critical mass of MMTs but uh, you know what what would be a a good talking point to address that one I think never entertain a how will we pay for it question I hope this crisis puts the final nail in the coffin of that pay for canard that um, before the New Deal, there were decades of organizing and groups that were building coalitions. So whatever work we, we have been doing so far, it has, to, it has to move forward. Every change happens from the ground up. And even though we have governments that are not so amenable and open to progressive changes, the way I see this moment is as this giant ship that is going into the iceberg, right? And it is, it can't stop, you know, and, and we're seeing this happening in slow motion and we are still adapting to like, what would be the fallout of this moment? And we are still too slow to figure out what will be necessary. And we will um, come to a realization and hopefully sooner because we've lived through depressions before and through major calamities before, and hopefully we'll come to the realization sooner that we must demand for government to do far more and that we want to come out of this moment with a different sort of economy, one that is far more stable, that provides basic economic rights to folks and that will will have to be restructured, no doubt. You know, we could try to keep throwing all these policies at the wall and see what sticks, but at some point we will have to do some very heavy thinking, you know, very difficult thinking about specific structural reforms. And the sooner that we come to this moment, the better, because we clearly have the financial resources. It's how we mobilize the real resources that is it is the question that MMT have been asking, and I think we have arrived to it. And I hope that that's the next the, the, the next final, conversation, the final battle. Great. Well, with that, that was a, a great way to end. Thank you so much for your time, Pavlina, and thank you for all the work that you've done over the years. You know, we're all avid readers and listeners and watchers of it. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you for all of your work. I, you know, when people ask me what podcast do you listen, I'm like there's one MMT podcast you absolutely must listen to. Oh, great. Great. Oh, that makes me so happy. Oh, great. That's brilliant. Okay, so we'll say goodbye now and uh, everybody stay safe. Wash your hands. Don't touch the doorknobs. Just use your elbows. Thanks again, Pavlino. Thanks again, Patricia. Best to you. Best to you. Stay safe, guys. Okay, bye, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Editing and post-production was by Damien Caldwell. Thanks for listening.